Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, thank you, Josette, by the way. Um, in some ways, all I'm going to do tonight is try to show you the dynamics that can account for a changed life like the one you heard or a changed family like the one you've heard about. How does that happen? Why does that happen? That's what I'd like to talk to you about. Now, when um, the subject of the coherence of Christianity comes up, uh, is Christianity coherent? Is it cogent? Does it make sense? I think ordinarily we go immediately to talking about God. Does he exist? Who is, what is he like? Or we go to talk about uh, to Jesus and his claims, or maybe is the Bible true? Can we trust it? And those are all very important subjects. But I often feel that what gets overlooked in the beginning, that if you're a person who's looking at Christianity and you're trying to make sense of it, one of the subjects that's overlooked is what uh, the Bible says, what, what the Christian faith says about the human heart about human nature, and especially about that word sin. Now, why I want to look at that with you tonight is uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, some, uh, one wag some years ago put it this way, uh, of all the Christian doctrines, only the doctrine of sin is the one, uh, the doctrine of sin is the one Christian doctrine, the only Christian doctrine that, um, for which there's empirical absolute proof. Uh, it's the one thing we can say, I can prove it to you. However, another way to put it is this. An awful lot about what the Christian faith teaches about salvation and about Jesus doesn't make sense unless you understand uh, what the Bible teaches about the human heart. I have often realized now, as over the years, I live in New York. It's a, very, a place filled with very skeptical people, just like Cambridge and a lot of other places. Uh, and I often find that unless I explain what the Bible says about the human heart, very often everything else I'm trying to tell people doesn't make much sense. So let's go there, and let's go there through a theme, and let me introduce the theme with a question. What thing, if you lost it, could almost um, mean that you would lose the will to live? What thing, if you lost it, could mean that almost all significance and value would be drained out of your life. Whatever that thing is, and I'm here tonight to show you that you've got at least something like that in your life. Whatever that thing is, the Bible calls it an idol, a counterfeit God, a, an alternate pseudo-salvation, an idol. An idol is anything more fundamental than God to your happiness, meaning in life, or identity. Uh, an idol is <clears throat> something more important to God, more fundamental for your sense of self-worth, for your sense of significance and value, for your sense of security. An idol is anything you love more than God or rest your heart in more than God. Therefore, idols are not bad things, they're good things which you're looking to to give you what only God can give you. They're created things that you're looking to to give what only a creator, if he exists, could give you. So uh, an idol can be career, family, children, spouse, achievement, uh, some political cause, your own physical attractiveness, romance, human approval, power, comfort, financial security, almost anything. And all those are good things. St. Augustine was the most brilliant and perhaps the first Christian thinker uh, past the Bible to expound on this subject, especially in his book, The Confessions. And there he defines sin in a way we probably don't think of. We, when you and I think of sin, we think of uh, violations of the law, behavior. And of course that's true because you know, murder and robbery and lying, all the things that are there in the Ten Commandments, those behaviors are sin. But if you want to go deeper to ask what about the human heart produces those kinds of behaviors, St. Augustine says the essence of sin is disordered love. And what he means is love's out of order. Loving something which you ought to be loving fourth, second, or first. Something that you ought to love, but you shouldn't love it supremely. So for example, uh, just one example of disordered love, an easy one is, uh, should you love your career? Sure. Should, it, you, should you have a passion to do well in your career and be successful? Yes. 
Should you love your family? Should you love the relationships in your family? Yes. But if you love your career more than your family, if it's out of order, if you put your career ahead of your family, so you're always away from your family, or so your family is always getting second place, you know what's going to happen? You know, I live in Manhattan, and uh, in Manhattan we're very secular people, and we think of, uh, we don't think we're very religious, and when we ever hear about primitive uh, practice, child sacrifice, in ancient times, or maybe places in the world today, we're just horrified. How awful! That, you, that, that, that the gods would be, uh, you'd sacrifice these gods by sa sacrificing your own children, and yet, in Manhattan, there's an awful lot of jobs that, that require, if you're going to be successful in them, that you perform child sacrifice. That you so neglect your family and so neglect your children that by the time they get a little bit older, they are so angry, they are so embittered, they're so messed up that ironically, because you loved your career ahead of your family, you'll find that the family explosions that happen will hurt your career. And therefore, what this means is if you love things third that ought to be second or things, you know, uh, first that ought to be third, there's breakdown in your life. Idolatry is an idol always will break your heart uh, because no created thing can bear the freight of your deepest hopes or the weight of your soul's longings. Idols will always break your heart. So let me give some examples. Uh, Ernest Becker, a brilliant writer, uh, who uh, won the Pulitzer Prize years ago in a, with a book, The Denial of Death. Ernest Becker uh, was uh, an agnostic or an atheist. He said he didn't believe in God, very much a secular person. But he also recognized the problem of not believing in God because through his book, Denial of Death, he's constantly talking about the fact that if you uh, don't have a God, there's a tendency for you to take something else in your life and turn it into a God. And he gives this example. He says, we see how modern people have put themselves in an impossible position. Modern secular people still need to feel like their lives matter in the grand scheme of things. They still need to feel that there's some higher meaning and that they have experienced some kind of great love. But if there's no longer any God, how are we supposed to do this? One of the first ways that occurred to modern people, to the modern person, was what's been called the romantic solution. The self-glorification that we need in our innermost being, now in many cases we look to get from our love partner. The lover becomes the way to fulfill one's very life. The worth and meaning now that you want comes from the loved one. The romantic option may be ingenious and it may be uh, creative, but it is a lie that must fail. What is it we want when we elevate the love partner to the position of God? We want redemption. Nothing less. We want to be rid of our faults. We want to be rid of our feeling of nothingness. That's why we fall in love. We want to be justified. We want to know that our existence is not in vain. We turn to the love partner for validation. We expect them to make us good, to make us real through love. Needless to say, human beings cannot do this. Now that's just romance, and I think we all resonate with that. If not you, so you certainly know people who are doing that. That's idolatry. Let me give you another example. This is a much briefer thing, but it gets at it. I read an article some years ago in the New York Times about what happens to really good athletes when they have a career-ending career injury. Now we're not just talking about professional athletes. Very often you also have a very gifted amateur athletes. What happens when a, uh, along comes a, uh, an injury and that's the end of the career? And the, uh, the doctors who treat athletes say they not only need physical care for their injury, they almost always need therapy. Um, uh, it, sa it says here, well let me just read it, it says usually depression sets in and it's not physiological. Why? One doctor says it's simple. The injury sends them into an existential crisis. Who am I anyway, they ask. It's devastating, 
because very often the loss of their athleticism has totally wiped out their reason for being. By the way, this also happens when athletes uh, retire. Why? Why is it that some athletes make the jump and some athletes never ever get over it, the, law, the end of their career? What's the difference between uh, just honoring a good thing and turning a good thing into an ultimate thing? What's the difference? All the difference in the world. All the difference as to whether you're, able, you're going to be able to live your life functionally. Here's another example. How about um, <clears throat> artist and celebrity? Cynthia Heimel writes for the uh, Village Voice, and she's a kind of snarky writer. She's a funny writer. And um, if you lived in downtown Manhattan, and if you lived there for many, many years, almost everybody, even I, actually, not that I live in downtown Manhattan, but uh, if you live in Manhattan for a long enough time, you meet people when they're aspiring to be celebrities or aspiring to be actors or actresses and get into the theater or movies. And, you know, you know, one out of a very small number actually make it. And therefore, almost all of us who have been around know somebody who have made it. They've, they got to Hollywood, you know, and we remember when, when they were just waiters and waitresses at a local uh, uh, bar or something like that. And Cynthia Heimel knew quite a few, but she also noticed something happened to them. And she actually, in the, this article, she lists several names that you would know, but I'm not going to tell you. Uh, who they are, because I think it's a little unfair. Well, no, no, I won't. Uh, I can, t yeah, never mind. Somebody's going to ask me the question now. But anyway, here's what she says. Listen, here, this is funny and amazing. I pity celebrities, she said. No, I do. Celebrities were once perfectly pleasant human beings. But now their wrath is awful. You see, they wanted fame. They worked, they pushed. And the morning after each one of them became famous, they all wanted to take an overdose. Because that giant thing they were striving for, that thing that was going to make everything okay, that was going to make their lives bearable, that was going to provide them with personal fulfillment and ha happiness, it actually happened. And the day after they woke up, and they were still them. The disillusionment turned them howling and insufferable. And then she adds, and it always takes my breath away, she says, I think when God wants to play a really rotten practical joke on you, he grants you your deepest wish and then giggles merrily when you realize you want to kill yourself. <laughs> now, I would say, uh, as a, a teacher of the Bible, that the motivation there on God's part is not, that's not fair. God does not give you your deepest wish and then giggle merrily. But what she's saying is at, almost at the very heart of Romans chapter 1, which says the very worst thing that God could ever do to anybody who is saying, oh, I don't want to live for God, I want to live for my career. I don't want to live for God, I want to live for my spouse. I want to live for God, I want to live for my children or this or that. I, I want to live for professional success. The worst thing I could possibly do is to actually give it to you. Because whatever that is, especially if you become successful at it, you will find that it doesn't give you what you thought it would. You'll wake up the next morning and you'll want to take an overdose. And you realize, wait a minute, wait a minute. See, those of us who are not successful, and that's most of us, haven't really achieved success, we, we can kind of live in the illusion that if we only broke through, then we'd finally feel good about ourselves. Then, we, then we'd really finally have... Uh, that, that emptiness inside would finally be filled. But there's a small number of people who have really hit the top, way to the top, and they do want to kill themselves in many cases. Or they certainly get cynical or nihilistic or jaded or bitter, do they not? Why? Because the next morning they wake up and they find they're still them. Perhaps the most um, uh, sad and poignant of my examples tonight, and this is... Uh, I always shudder a little bit when I read it, is David Foster Wallace, who was a, um, a great uh, writer. He was a novelist, uh, an American novelist. At least I don't have any idea, frankly, how well known he was across the world. But in America, he was one of the leading lights of, of postmodern uh, novelists and writers. And he was highly respected and loved. Uh, and um, a couple of years ago, he committed suicide in his late 40s. Not too long before he committed suicide, he gave a commencement address 
at a liberal arts college. And this commencement address, as soon as it was given, was noted by many people as being unusual because David Foster Wallace, like a lot of postmodern uh, writers, is impenetrable. He's a very hard, you know, when you read his work, you have no idea what it means and uh, you're supposed to sit and discuss it and think about it and that's, it, that's the point. Uh, many folks have, off, have, many folks pointed out that this, uh, this commencement speech was uh, very, very lucid, unusually lucid and direct. Uh, and accessible, but it was not long before he killed himself, and listen to this. He says in the commencement address, in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing a spiritual God like Jesus Christ or Allah or Yahweh or the Wiccan mother goddess. He says, he says, the compelling reason for choosing that kind of God is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. And then he gives examples. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough and you will never feel you have enough. If you worship your body and beauty and sexual allure and you do that, then you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. If you worship power, you will end up feeling weak and afraid. And you will need ever more and more power over others just to numb you to your own fear. If you worship your intellect, if that's what you live for, for being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. But the insidious thing about all these forms of worship is that they're unconscious. They are default settings. Now, I do not know enough about David Foster Wallace to uh, speculate exactly on the relationship between what he said here to his suicide, though everybody says there's some kind of link. I think we can be confident to say that it was something that ate him alive. One of the things in this list, or maybe something he didn't list, ate him alive. And he says, unless you have a God who can deliver on the hopes that you put in these things, it's going to eat you alive. Now, if this is the case, and if he's right, by the way, I, on websites, especially atheist websites, I've seen so many atheists extremely put out by this commencement address. Because even though David Foster Wallace was essentially a secular person, he had no particular religious beliefs, I've seen many atheists say how upset they are that he would say that there are no such thing as atheists, that everybody worships, that everybody builds their life on something. And I've seen atheists very upset. He says, worship means coming and sitting down in a building and at a religious institution and observing religious services. It's ridiculous to call anything that you live for worship. And that shows exactly what he says. And that is the problem with the, the insidious thing about all these forms of worship is they're unconscious. And if you don't see them yet, you're very, very young. The older you get, the harder it is to hide from yourself that you have really bound your heart up with something, a kind of God and you are betting your life on it, and you are investing so much in it. And only as you get older and older do you begin to realize what Cynthia Heimel says, and that is, even if I get it, I think I'm gonna wake up and realize, is this all there is? Now, if this is true, and we all have these idols, and they can really eat us alive if we don't recognize them before it's too late, then what do you do? Uh, well, first of all, you have to try to recognize what they are. How do we know what they are? Now, let me give you a couple of ideas. How do you spot the symptoms of idolatry in your life? Alfred Adler, a very, uh, you know, a leading psychologist, sort of post-Freud, uh, said that it's very hard to find out what you're really living for by just asking yourself that question. So if I ask you, what are you really living for? Your answers will be, oh, I'm living for my family, or I'm living for this political cause, or maybe you'll say, I'm living for God. You know, I'm a religious person, I'm living for God. Adler says, 
The way to find out what you're really living for is not to ask that question because you really don't know your own heart very well. Instead, he says, look at your nightmares. What is your worst nightmare? What thing, I know I started like this, but I want to go deeper. What thing, if it were absent, would almost take away your desire to live? So, for example, let's say you're engaged to somebody and this person you love gives you a tremendous amount of meaning in life. And of course, he or she will. But then let's say something happens and you break up. And it was a great relationship. And what are you going to feel? You're going to feel tremendous grief. Because it was a good thing. It was a good thing. And, you're going to, and if you lose it, it's, you're going to feel terrible for a long time. But if you've turned that person into not just a good thing, but an ultimate thing, if that person and what they provide to you is the reason almost that you get up in the morning, if that person's love is the main reason you feel like you're really any good, you don't admit that to anybody else, but in your heart that's how you feel. If you turn a good thing into an ultimate thing and you lose that, it will devastate you. It will destroy you. It doesn't necessarily have to make you suicidal, but it often does. Uh, let me give you two quick uh, examples of this. There was a, there's a, in the begin. I'm not trying to plug the book, but in the beginning of the Counterfeit Gods book, which I wrote pretty recently, I have a list. There's many places on the web you can find these lists. A list of high profile, <clears throat> high profile suicides of leaders of major financial institutions that occurred generally in uh, 2008 when the first part of the great economic meltdown, world uh, economic crisis happened. Many, many people who knew that they, were, uh, they had lost so much money killed themselves, many. On the other hand, I had an experience. I, uh, I, got to, I tried it very hard to uh, you know, hide this person's identity here, as I tell you. Uh, I had an experience with a woman not too long ago who um, has over the last few years given a good number of very large gifts to Christian organizations because she's made a lot of money in the financial world. I went by to see her and her, she was in tears. She said, this is, I've had the worst day in my career today. <laughs> Just my luck to show up as a pastor on the day. It was the worst day of her career. You know, gosh, now I'm going to have to be pastoral. Um, what do I do? But I didn't have to worry because she did it for me. Uh, and she said, I'm almost sure that at least uh, the kind of, she said, for the last five or six years, I've made a lot of money. And I'm in a field that's almost, uh, has almost been devastated. And I can tell you right now that almost certainly I'm never going to make anything like the kind of money I've been making. I might make 10% of what I used to make a year. I might make 5% of what I used to make a year. I, my career is largely over. It doesn't mean I won't be able to support myself. But she says, I'm, I'm going to have to change everything, the way in which I live, where I live, you know, my home, everything. And then she says, but I'm kind of excited. Because she says, in the past, you know, I love my church. And she says, in the past, I had a lot more money than time. So I had to give you the money. But now I'm going to have a lot more time than money. So I'm going, to be need to, I'm going to need to be retrained. What can I do for the church now? I'm actually kind of excited in a way. Why didn't she kill herself like all of her friends were killing themselves? Because to them, the people who were devastated, I don't mean they all killed themselves, but for the people who were devastated, who felt like if I can't live these places, if I can't belong to this club anymore, if I can't live at this level anymore, my life's over, it's over. For them, the money wasn't just money. The money was their image, was their identity, it was their, uh, it was what the Bible calls their righteousness, their sense of acceptability, their sense of, of, of significance. It wasn't just money. You know, it was a kind of salvation. And for her, it was just money. Because Jesus was her salvation. I talked in a much sadder, um, she was able to make the jump, in other words. I talked uh, a much sadder story. Um, some years ago, I talked to a woman who was in and out of uh, mental institutions, and sometimes she'd come to church, sometimes not. And at one point, uh, her counselor talked to me and said, you know, you're her pastor, so I'd like to just brief you on what her problems are. And the counselor, who was, uh, uh, you know, he, he was very polite to me as a pastor. He wasn't a Christian believer at all. But he says, he says, this is a woman who is a very, very good musician. 
And her parents raised her to be a great musician, put a lot of pressure on her to be a great musician. And even though she's really quite a good musician, she's not the world class, famous, uh, you know, number one, number two, number three kind of artist in her field that she all of her life worked to be and that her parents were sure she would be. She's just a good musician and she can't handle it. If she, and he said, she says, you know, she believes in God and she says she believes in God and she prays, but frankly, this is her God and it has failed her. She believes, she says, oh, I believe in salvation through Jesus. And this is, this guy said to me, he says, but this is her salvation, and she has failed. And her parents' approval is more important functionally in her heart than God. Uh, her effort to be a great musician is functionally more important than anything else she believes. So what she believes about God has actually almost nothing to do with how her heart really works. And even he realized that if she actually began to believe what she said she believed, deep in the center of her heart, she'd be free. Um, and I've, I'm not sh I don't know where she is at this point, and I've lost track of her for various reasons. I hope she is. Now, let me give you a little bit of a uh, biblical orientation here. Where does the Bible talk about this? Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 25 is the classic New Testament. Uh, it's the locus classicus uh, on this subject. And essentially, Paul says there that, that Underneath everything else, he says, quote, we worship and serve created things rather than the creator. We worship and serve created things rather than the creator. And what it does is it creates not just nightmares, by the way. So here's, I'm trying to tell you, the second way to look at, to, to, the second set of symptoms to find your idols is not just look at your nightmares, but look at your most uncontrollable emotions. Because Paul says, when you worship something, you serve it. See? He says they worship and served created things rather than the creator. So if you worship something, if it's more important to you than God, you are to some degree enslaved to it. It drives you. You can't not have it. You can't live without it. And what that does is it creates uncontrollable emotions. I'll give you, I'll give you one example. Uh, I got more than that, but let me just give you one example. Some years ago, I talked to two women, uh, not, not the same year, but close enough that I could compare them. And both of them had husbands and they had one teenage son. And in both cases, their teenage sons were going off the rails. Uh, they were beginning to, they were having trouble in school, they were having uh, uh, trouble with the law, getting in trouble, and they clearly were, uh, both sons were going bad because the fathers were being lousy fathers. The fathers were cold, they were remote, they had no time for their sons, and the wives could see that the husbands were ruining the son, their, their sons' lives. In both cases, the wives came to me as a pastor, because they came to my church saying, um, you've got to help me because I am so bitter. I am so bitter and angry that our communication is breaking down between me and my husband, and I'm not even sure our marriage is going to survive. So what I did in both cases was, I think what I was supposed to do, I said, are you professing Christians? Yes. And uh, do you believe in forgiveness and the importance of forgiveness? Yes. And that God's forgiven you? Yes. And you must forgive others? Yes. So we sat down, we looked at texts, we prayed together, we talked about, you know, you have to forgive your husband, let's pray for that, let's pray to God for that. To my surprise, uh, let's call her uh, Mother A, who had actually probably the worst husband of the two, and who actually hadn't been in the Christian church for a very long time, forgave. She broke through. Her anger dissipated. It was difficult. And then what she was able to do is start to move on, and it actually helped the communication, because when you're bitter towards somebody, you really can't communicate. You can't persuade them. You're just too furious at them. And their marriage got better. And because the marriage got better, the husband heard somewhat what he, she was saying, and he improved somewhat, enough for uh, the son to improve somewhat, and therefore, basically, we have a happy ending. But Mother B, who had been in the church much longer, and who, from what I could tell, actually probably had the better of the two husbands, could never do it. She could not forgive. She couldn't let go. She was furious. She was angry. She couldn't stand him. And here's the great irony. Why was she unable to do it, even though she tried? Why were her emotions uncontrollable? Why was her anger more than she could handle? Because even though I believe the first mother loved her son, the second mother 
made her son into the, her meaning in life. What, she looked at her son, and, and actually she spoke like this, in her heart of hearts, she said, if my son is happy, if my son grows up well-adjusted and loving me and having a happy life, then I'll know I did something right. Because I haven't really done much of anything else right. I haven't accomplished much of anything else. But if I just am a good mother to him and he grows up, then I'll feel like, you know, my life really had some kind of significance. Do you realize what she just did? Her mothering was her salvation. Her son was her savior and his love. In spite of the fact that she came to, Christ, you know, to Christian church and said, oh, Jesus is my savior, but her son was her savior. Functionally, really, honestly. The Bible says we all worship and serve something besides the creator in our natural default mode. And that means that, ironically, she couldn't forgive her husband. She stayed angry at him. The relationship broke down. The communication broke down. The marriage broke apart. And the son got worse. Ironically, by loving her son more than she loved God, she destroyed him. Because your, your idol will always break your heart. Now, uncontrollable emotions, you see, if, if, if something is not just a good thing, if money's not just money, if my son's not just my son, you know, if my ministry's not just my ministry, but it's like a kind of salvation, a kind of justification, a feeling like now I'm justified. Now, now uh, you know, my life means something. It's not all for loss. If you look to anything like that, it will eat you alive. So finally, we have to come to the place of asking, what do we do about it? And here's what we have to do about it. And I hope now you see, uh, as I wrap up, why this, this subject is important, regardless of where you are spiritually, regardless of where you are when it comes to faith. For example, if you say, I'm not sure I believe in Christianity. Uh, in fact, I'm still having trouble figuring it out. In New York City, I found very often one of the reasons why people find Christianity not cogent is because the cross doesn't seem cogent. Doesn't, Jesus dying on the cross to forgive us for our sins? Well, that's an interesting thing, many of my skeptical friends say. But uh, why? Why? I don't feel that bad. I'm, I'm sure there are murders, murderers and robbers and, and people who've done terrible things. And maybe they will uh, say, oh, I'm terrible and I need God to save me through forgiveness. But for the most of the rest of us, we're decent people. We live pretty good lives. You know, I don't think I'm so bad that I need that. Um, but the problem, the essence, the essence of your trouble, the essence of sin is not the bad things is turning a good thing into an ultimate thing, which, by the way, leads to bitterness, which can lead to murder, it can lead to harm, it can lead to oppression. See, all the bad things, all the, behaviorally, the behavioral bad things, uh, you know, like lying and like uh, viciousness and all those things, it comes from idolatry. And even if you're living a good life, your idolatry will still destroy you. All of our hearts good people and bad people. Once you understand the concept of idolatry, all of our hearts are still riddled with sin, riddled with self-centeredness, riddled with self-justification, riddled with our desire essentially to keep control of our lives by saying, if I have this, then I am worth it, then I am valuable. And in a sense, I don't really need God. That's sin. And once you understand idolatry, I've had an awful lot of my skeptical friends in New York say, if that's sin, well, yeah, of course I'm sinful. And very often they say, I'm not sure I believe in God, but I can see, your prop I can see the point. In fact, some people say, yes, I, I am driven, I am anxious, these things probably are too important to me. And maybe, maybe, well, you know, it, I, I feel that when a person who doesn't believe hears, idolatry, hears about idolatry and actually sees it in their own life, there's a tendency for them to say, I don't know if I believe in Christianity, but it would be great if it was true. And if you get to that place, I think you not only know, you understand idolatry, but you actually start to, you've started to understand your own heart. And therefore, idolatry shows us why the gospel is necessary, why Jesus had to die on the cross for our sins, because we're all riddled with idolatry, good people and bad people, and we need God's forgiveness. But it's not enough just to look at the objective 
um, accomplishment of Jesus on the cross. He died for our sins. He paid for our sins. So now you're free from the guilt of your idolatry. He's, if you go to God and say, God, Father, accept me because of what Jesus has done, he will accept you because your idolatry sins have been forgiven. But it's not enough just to look at the objective uh, accomplishment of the cross. You have to subjectively bring into your life what God has done and what Jesus particularly has done on the cross for you. It has to become, when you see his love for you and his sacrifice for you and, uh, and doing it out of desire for you, that has to become so beautiful, that has to become so compelling, that has to so melt you and move you, that then you can take that subjective joy you have in what he's done for you and apply it to your idols. Because that's what turns money into just money. What turns spouses into just spouses, and sons into just sons, and daughters into just daughters. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, in the Bible, there's a place where Jacob, uh, wants to, she, he falls in love with Leah, and he says to Leah, pardon me, he falls in love with Rachel, excuse me. There's another part of the story, but I'm not going to go into that. And he goes to Rachel's father, Laban, and says, please, I'd like to marry your daughter. And of course, in those days, you had to pay a price to the family if you're going to marry your, the daughter. And Laban says, you have to work for me for seven years, seven years hard labor if you're going to get Rachel. And that was an exorbitant bride price even then. But the text tells us in Genesis 29, it tells us, but Jacob, for Jacob, those seven years went by like that. It, it, it felt like no trouble or no time at all because of his love for her. He had this overmastering positive passion. He loved Rachel so much that it enabled him not to care about the drudgery of the work. Now, Thomas Chalmers, the great uh, Scottish minister and theologian, wrote a famous sermon called The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. And Thomas Chalmers says, nobody changes bad habits by just trying. Nobody changes bad habits just uh, by saying, I'm going to really try hard to change. Nobody overcomes being scared or overcomes racial prejudice or anything just by trying. Here's what he says, overcomes your character flaws. He says, the heart is so constituted that the only way to dispossess it of an old affection is through the expulsive power of a new one. What you need to drive out your fears and your uncontrollable emotions and all those things that are driving you and, and even that emptiness that you're trying to fill with these false gods. The one thing you need is an overmastering positive passion. And what is that? Um, I love my wife. I actually have a very good marriage. And one of the things I learned from reading the letters of John Newton, who also had a good marriage, was that... Uh, you're, if in a good marriage, your spouse can become your biggest idol. I actually have that problem. I struggle with it all the time. Uh, I respect my wife's opinion over everybody else, and I want her affection more than anybody else's. And even now, after 35 years of preaching on my way home, you know, on, after a Sunday, I want to know what she thinks of the sermon. I don't really care what anybody else thinks. And uh, she's heard me, and she's heard me, and if she says it was a good sermon, it's probably a pretty good sermon. And so often, she doesn't think it's a good sermon. And then I, and she doesn't want to tell me, because she knows about the idolatry problem. So I say, hey, so did, you, did you like the service today? Which it really means, what did you think of my sermon? <laughs> and, uh, and she says, oh yeah. I said, well, the sermon, I mean, did you have any suggestions? You know, which is my way of trying to see if you have any suggestions, which means please gush or something. And uh, if she ever says, it was fine, I'm crestfallen. Still, 30, you know, 60 years old, 35 years, I mean. And she gets furious at me, and she should. She says, don't you dare put this kind of pressure on me. She says, you know, at this point, um, it's what God thinks about you. It's, it's you stand before God, not me. So we are very sensitive to our various idolatries. I'm not going to tell you about hers. It's not fair. I'll confess my own sins. But the, the fact of the matter is that both of us realize something. Someday one of us is going to look at the other one in a coffin. One of us is going to be standing there and the other one's going to be in a coffin. And if the person in the coffin is our Savior, 
If, when, see, if you make any human being more important than God, when that human being is lying in the coffin, your God's not going to be able to help you when your heart is breaking. What is going to get my heart to pull itself off of my wife so she's just a wife? So I can really love her truly. Remember that woman? Her, her, because her son was more than a son to her, he didn't she didn't love him right. Because their careers were more than careers, they didn't execute them right. And because my wife tends to be more than just a wife to me, I'm in great danger. What is going to pull my heart off of my wife so that I can just love her? I've got to see the beauty of what Jesus Christ has done. Let me close with this illustration. Years ago, I talked to a woman who lived in a trailer park right near my little church in my little town in Hopewell, Virginia. And I was a young minister, and I was trying to help her. She had really had a very hard life, but she ended up teaching me more because she knew more about life than I did. And here's what her problem was. She had lived a very hard life. At this time, she was in her 40s. Uh, she'd been in and out of jail, I think. I know she'd been in and out of drug addiction. You could just tell by looking at her, she looked a lot older than her, being in her early 40s, though she was. She had been cursed by being born beautiful. Evidently, she was a beautiful child, she was a beautiful little girl, and she was an absolutely beautiful young woman. And because of that, there were always men after her, especially powerful men, to whom having a, a woman like, looking like that was a badge of uh, power. And because of that, she had turned male affection into the idol of her life. She literally felt <clears throat> she was nobody unless somebody loved her, especially a man. And as a result, she, she did not put up decent boundaries, uh, she let men abuse her, sometimes physically. Uh, she was not selective about who she was with. She just needed one at any given time. And as a result, she was a subject of violence. She was in and out of prison. She was in and out of drug, drug, drug addiction. She, was, she had a horrible life. And then what happened at the very end was uh, it all broke down, uh, and she became a Christian. And as she became a Christian, she began therapy. And the therapist was very happy. It was very helpful to her in some ways. But here's, uh, she told me this. She told me at one point, the therapist came and said, look, your problem is you've based your self-image and your identity and your significance and security on male affection. Right, she said. And this has been terrible for you. No boundaries, abuse, right. You just can't love yourself unless you know that some man loves you. Right. So here's what I want you to do, said the therapist. You've got to get a career. You've got to become a successful career woman. We've got to help you end your, I mean, get, get the rest of your uh, education and get a marketable skill, and then you get a career and you're self-sufficient and you'll feel good about yourself because you will be a successful career woman. And she said, this is what she told me, she said to her therapist, look, with all due respect, you've helped me so much, but let me just ask, you want me to take a typical female idol which I've built my life on, which has destroyed my life, and now you want me to adopt a typical male idol. <laughs> uh, so instead of getting all my self-esteem from a man loving me, now I'm going to get all my self-esteem from being successful and making money. She says, what if I don't want either addiction? Can't you let me build my life on something that uh, doesn't, you know, can't let me down? that isn't dependent on me performing and earning my salvation. And the therapist says, well, I don't know. But see, she already did know. She was still working it out. And she came to Colossians chapter 3. There's a place there where it says, uh, your life now, if you're a Christian, is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, we will appear with him in glory. And that riveted her. And she realized what that meant. Because Jesus died for her. Because Jesus loved her because Jesus poured herself, himself out for her. Every other man had basically made her pour herself out for him. For her, yeah, for him. In other words, every other man came into, into her life saying, your life for mine. And Jesus had come into her life and said, my life for you. I'm pouring my life out for you. And as a result, Jesus became, as it were, you know, her Rachel, her treasure her pearl of great price. And she says, now when I see a guy coming after me or even looking at me like this, I say something in my heart. And what I say to myself in my heart, not out loud, <laughs> but in my heart, I look at this guy and I say, hey, hi, 
guy. You know, maybe, maybe you're great. Maybe we'll get together, and that would be nice. Maybe we'll get married, that would be nice. But I want you to know, you will never be my life. Christ is my life. And because I won't make you into a savior, I might end up making you a really good wife. Do you understand how what the Bible says about idolatry, how what the Bible says about sin, makes sense of your life, makes sense of your heart, makes sense then of the cross, and makes sense of the world? I hope you do. And now we're going to get a chance to uh, ask some questions. So uh, Stephen's going to tell you how to do that. Thank you again very much to, to the jazz band. I feel very mean uh, making them stop playing. Uh, thanks very much, fellas. Uh, we got, uh, I, I've lost count, um, 30, 40 questions, uh, so I'm sorry, we can't possibly um, cover all of them. Uh, thank you for texting lots in. Um, here's a first. Um, Tim, why doesn't everyone kill themselves like you suggest? <laughs> sorry, that isn't quite right. You weren't suggesting that people should kill themselves, were you? Uh, why do many non-Christian people live well-adjusted and satisfying lives? Uh, yes, and I, I'm pretty sure that that was um, supposed to be a joke that I didn't suggest. Actually, the Cynthia Heimel uh, quote is a better example of what happens. Um, if you have made something an idol and you don't uh, achieve it, or don't even get close, you can live an awful long time without uh, the uh, disillusionment that successful people experience. Uh, you can say, I know it would be okay, eventually it might be okay eventually. So I've, I've seen plenty of folks uh, that actually haven't realized how empty their lives are or how, um, uh, or how, or how um, weak the payoff is of their particular idolatry because they, they, because they spend so many years still with the hope they're going to achieve what they're hoping to achieve, but not actually having it. Uh, I think that Cynthia Heimel's right when she says that most folks who uh, are extremely successful very often tend not so much to kill themselves, even though she, uh, uh, that's a bit of a, an exaggeration, however, she's, what she's saying is people find that they get uh, bitter, cynical, nihilistic, very, very jaded. Uh, but I think the other thing to say is when you say, why do so many non-Christian people live well-adjusted and satisfying lives, I would say that there is a, uh, uh, there is a certain, there are, there are, I hate to get into a whole other um, line of theological reasoning. The Bible says that there is both special grace and common grace. Common grace is the kind of wisdom and moderation and uh, uh, a good sense that God gives to all human beings because they're in his image and they have a certain sense of who God is. Special grace is the intervening Holy Spirit that comes in and does a radical uh, uh, restructuring of the heart. And the fact is that there's a pretty good number of folks who've got quite a bit of common grace. And uh, especially those who don't actually reach the top in many cases, but actually find themselves uh, always traveling and never arriving. And a combination of those things mean there's plenty of uh, folks who don't, uh, uh, who, who lead pretty well-adjusted lives. But I guess maybe I just say one other thing. I'm, as I said, I, I like to refer to my advanced age. As time goes on, uh, not just uh, many of the people who are my age who don't believe uh, find it more and more difficult to lead those satisfying lives. They begin to recognize the uh, the nature of the things that we would call idols and that they haven't recognized by now. Uh, David Foster Wallace is right in saying that it's uh, insidious. They don't recognize it as worship, but as time goes on, you do. So my guess is the people who live very well-adjusted lives tend to be younger, tend to have a lot of common grace, and uh, tend to uh, be traveling without arriving uh, if they lead really well-adjusted lives without um, a full-on relationship with God. Tim, thank you. Uh, another person has asked, uh, if, as you say, we need to look for our salvation in a non-human creation, um, how can I know the Christian God is the right way to go? Mm. 
David Foster Wallace said, it's better to, to worship a real God, then he gave a list, remember? The Wiccan Mother Goddess, Allah, Yahweh, Jesus Christ, so forth. And maybe this is referring to that. If so, I, that's a great question. How can I know then that the Christian God is the right way to go? Every other, I'm gonna say this with all due respect, uh, to the other religions and the wisdom in them and the, uh, the moral lives that they produce in their adherence. But every other religion says that the way you connect to God, the way you connect to the divine is through something you do. Uh, it could be transformation of consciousness. Uh, it could be uh, certain ethical prescriptions. You have to do this, you have to do this. Certain observation, uh, certain observances. Every other religion essentially says to you, uh, if you do these things, the Four Noble Truths, the f Five Pillars, then you will connect to God. The Christian Gospel is not just different than that, it's exactly the reverse. The Christian Gospel says there's nothing you do, in a sense, to earn your salvation. There's nothing you do to merit it or to perform it or to uh, achieve it. It is a absolutely free gift. Now, you remember the woman I talked to you about at the very end uh, from the trailer court? Remember how she put it? She said, I was trying to earn my salvation through male affection. And now you, O oh therapist, are asking me to earn my salvation the more normal male way through uh, success. Notice she was right in saying, every way except the Christian gospel and every way except through Jesus Christ, salvation is essentially something you earn, in which case you transfer, for, uh, you transfer your idolatry to your moral record. You're no longer maybe uh, uh, making career an idol. You're no longer trusting in this or that uh, as your salvation. Now, your moral record becomes your salvation. And that can be every bit as enslaving because you never feel like quite good enough. You're never sure you really lived a good enough life to keep in the blessing and to keep that divine connection. So in the end, the other religions don't give you a fundamental restructuring of the heart and the way in which the heart works which is self-justification and self-salvation. The gospel comes in and completely challenges that. And that's the reason why I would say the Christian God, and Jesus Christ in particular, uh, is the real challenge to idolatry and is the real destruction of idolatry in your life. And other forms of religion don't really do it. Tim, why do, someone's written, why do I need forgiveness from God for my idolatry? Uh, surely it's just my problem if my idol lets me down. Actually, that's great. These are great questions. Thank you very much. Because uh, I remember as I was speaking about that, I said, I, don't, I, almost, I almost went down that path, and I didn't, and now I will. Um, Remember, what I, remember disordered loves, that idea from uh, St. Augustine, loves out of order. What I like about the disordered loves idea is uh, there is a hierarchy of loves. I tried to give you an example where to love your career more than your family. Now, your family is not God, and yet to love your career more than your family is disordered love because your, your, your loves are not uh, in their proper place. Uh, so at that level, think about this. If you, um, if you really, uh, let's just say you were a, a single parent, maybe you are, and you, you really, tr truly, for your only child, you really did give up your whole life. You have worked like a dog to put the child through school. You worked like a dog to give the child, uh, a mo you know, a sort of at least a, a moderately normal life. Let's say you're pretty impoverished and you're, you're in a lot of difficulty, but you want your child to have, and let's just say we're not doing this idolatrously. I know we, I use that as an illustration. So for a minute, you're going to have to, you know, help me with my illustration. This illustration, it's not an idolatrous one. Imagine you're a single parent, you are in pretty bad straits, and you really, really sacrifice a lot just to give your child a normal life. Put him into a decent school. Uh, help him into a, a functional life. And what happens if the child gets all that from you and you give him all that and then out he goes or she goes and hardly calls you, hardly talks to you, Christmas cards, birthday cards, 
yes, of course. Uh, respect in a rather formal way, you know, to you, because after all, you are uh, the parent. But no love, certainly no gratitude, certainly it's, it's disordered love. It's, it's not giving the mother or the father, the parent, uh, the place that that person deserves. Now, God has created you. If he exists, he's created you. If, the, if, if God exists, he not only created you, but he keeps your molecules together from just running off. In a, you know, the Bible says uh, that he, he, holds the, he holds together the, the world, the universe, with the word of his power. He keeps you together. He keeps you alive every second. keeps your heart pumping. So uh, you owe God absolutely everything. And then on top of that, you not only owe him everything as a creator, you owe everything to him if it's true, what the Bible says, that he came to earth as Jesus Christ and died on the cross to absorb the debt instead of making you pay for it. He paid it himself. What do you owe him? You owe him uh, centrality, that he deserves to be in the center of your life. And therefore, you're absolutely right, and maybe I... Uh, I'm glad you've corrected me, or at least that you've corrected the impression I may have given you. And that is that idolatry messes your life up, but it's also deeply grievous to God. You know, you would weep over the fact that your child did not see what you did. You would weep over that. It would grieve you. It would be a stab in the heart. And idolatry stabs God in the heart. If there is a God, idolatry stabs him in the heart. So it not only grieves him and tramples upon him and uh, uh, wrongs him, it also destroys you. But frankly, it wrongs him primarily and wrongs you secondarily. And that's the proper way, I think, to see uh, what is wrong with idolatry. Uh, once a person accepts that uh, they have an idol in their hearts, uh, what part of the Bible uh, would you suggest would be most helpful for them uh, to start with reading? And why would you choose that? My, 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 my. That's actually, I don't think anybody's actually ever asked me that question. Like, where would you start? I probably would do uh, Galatians or Romans. And I think the reason for that is that Galatians, well, first of all, Romans has a section on idolatry. Uh, it's not long, but it bears a very careful study. Almost every verse tells you a little bit more about it. Uh, Galatians doesn't talk too much about it directly, but both of them talk about the difference between self-salvation and Christ's salvation. And they both, uh, what I love about Galatians is if you, it's all about the gospel. It's all about you're saved by grace. You're not saved by works. You're, you're, you don't save yourself. God saves you through Christ. So it's the gospel, but you can see at the very beginning, this is not a gospel, this epistle is not presenting the gospel to non-Christians. It's presenting the gospel to Christians. And it's Paul's way of saying, you say you believe the gospel, but you really don't, or you, 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 don't, you don't understand the ramifications of it. And therefore, uh, I would probably go to those two books first, but I, would, I think now that I've said that, I need to tell you, I don't believe there's one place in the scripture that uh, nails idolatry and the others do not. Uh, there's more about idolatry in the Old Testament probably than in, in the New. So um, there are suggestions in the back, the last chapter of the Counterfeit God's book that would be a little better even in telling you where to go from here. But I would start with Romans and Galatians since you asked where would you start in the Bible and why. I think we've got time for the last two questions. Sure. Um, if what you say is true, um, does God need to be true in order to have the beneficial effects that you're describing? Did you follow that? Uh, in other words, it, couldn't God just be a sort of, you know, it's a sort of concept that still operates and still functions effectively? Oh, oh yeah, well. Um, I think I'm going to have to give a negative answer to the question. Uh, if what you say is true, does God need to be true in order to... Oh, no, I'm sorry. You, the way he said it, it's a negative answer. <laughs> the way it's written, no. Well, it depends. If what you say, you're trying to help. <laughs> okay. Um, what I tried to say at the end was that that the subjective. Uh, no, no. 
It is absolutely necessary for God to be more than a concept for it to have the beneficial effects I'm talking about. Um, I've seen plenty of people accept the basic idea of idolatry. In fact, I said that many of my skeptical friends in New York, many, especially young people in New York um, who don't really understand Christianity, I go to idolatry right away, and here's the reason why. If you say, uh, do you believe in sin, they'll say, I don't think so. And uh, they say, what's sin? If I say, well, it's breaking the law, and they will say, well, who's to say what moral absolutes are? And we get in an argument about, you know, whose view of right and wrong is right or wrong. But if I instead go to uh, idolatry, almost always I have my folks, my friends say, I see your point. Because everybody has to admit that you live for something. And everybody has to admit you're getting your meaning out of something. And if I push them and say, you realize that means that the thing that you are living for has this, this kind of power over you. It drives you. Uh, it frightens you. If, if, uh, it, it, it creates inordinate guilt. It creates inordinate, yes, they see that. They see it. So I've had people who only have the idea of God as a, as a concept and maybe he exists, maybe he doesn't, understand idolatry, but that they can't do anything about their idols unless God becomes more than a concept, but that the love of God becomes a reality to your heart, a reality to your heart. It has to be, uh, it, it has to be almost palpable. You have to see what God has done through the cross. It has to move you. It has to make you weep, frankly, or it doesn't actually have the power to restructure your heart. Another way to put this is, um, I, the, the, one, the woman in, in Virginia once said, for a period of time, I knew God loved me, but what I really wanted was male affection. And so she said, I think she said this, I think it's where I got this idea. She said, God was on audio, but guys were on video. So what he meant was, God was saying, I love you, because I believed in his love. It was very conceptual. But male love was on video. And I don't know if you've ever tried to listen to something on audio while you're watching something on video, the video is more all absorbing and the audio, you can, you can hardly even listen to it. And uh, the only way for, for God and his love to go on video from audio is for you to have an encounter with him through faith in what he did through Jesus Christ on the cross. When that becomes a reality that moves you because you see you need it and because you see that uh, uh, you deserve to be cast off, but instead he's brought you in. See, when, then it becomes an existential reality and then the beneficial effects come. So what I'm basically saying is, no, God needs to be much more than a concept in order to receive the beneficial effects I'm speaking of. Um, the, this follows right on. It may, it may, you may feel you've answered it slightly already. Because um, it's, it's asking the question, what suggestions do you have for moving on yeah. from that intellectual understanding of a sacrifice of Christ? To, to an emotional one? Um, I don't want to say, well, hmm. do you have any suggestion for moving from an intellectual understanding of Christ to an emotional one? I wouldn't want to say you move from an intellectual to an emotional. No, no offense to the, to the person who wrote this. I understand what you're saying. Um, Jonathan Edwards, who was a, an American uh, minister and philosopher, uh, believes that the heart, when you read the Bible and you see what it says about the heart, uh, in English we tend to, to uh, we tend to associate the heart with the emotions. But you'll see often in the Bible, uh, people think with the heart and they feel with the heart and they even act with the heart. And so what Edward says is, if you want to be biblical in your understanding of the human uh, psychology, you could say that. The heart is like the command center, the control center. It's, the, uh, it's where your fundamental commitments are. And out of the heart comes your, both your feelings and your thinking and your actions. And so it's possible to have an emotional experience that doesn't change your life. I know, I've had them. To get moved and say, oh, I'm going to change my life, and then I don't change my life. Edwards would say, if you get emotional about something, but it actually doesn't change the volition, you know, emotional engagement without volitional engagement means your heart hasn't actually been affected. Um, and therefore, the, and the heart, by the way, is not just the mind, it's not just the, the emotions, it's also the mind. 
So over the years as a pastor, taking what Edward said, is my understanding is not that I want people to move from a more intellectual understanding of, of the faith and what Jesus did on the cross to an emotional one, I, but I want, I want their doctrine to begin to affect the heart and therefore the life. And the way to do that, as far as I know, is still ultimately through prayer. And prayer is not just talking, uh, talking about, to God about, please help me in these ways. Prayer is taking things you've read in your word, in his word, and instead of saying, now I believe it, asking yourself questions uh, like this. If I really believed this, how would I be different? What negative emotions wouldn't be there? What behavior wouldn't be there? Uh, if I really understood this, how would this make me different? Another way to meditate on it is not just to look at the truth, but to say, how does this truth enable me to adore God? How can I praise God for this instead of just saying, yep, I believe it? How can I praise him for it? What sins can I confess because of this? How can I say, oh, Lord, I don't live this way? So what's important is to take the truth and through adoration, through meditation, through confession, uh, take that truth and, and take several minutes every day to tr try to drive it into your heart until you begin, yes, to feel something. Uh, the danger with this is you're not after emotions. You're after just honoring God. You're after trying to make the, this truth not just a cognitive uh, concept in your mind, but a reality that affects your whole life. So what you have to do is you, you kind of work on your heart, but you don't go after your emotions. You work on it through meditation, meditating it in. You have to have as deep a prayer life as you possibly can. And you leave it up to God when it comes to feelings. You leave it up to God as to how much you're going to feel on a particular day. Don't, don't push on the emotions. Otherwise, weirdly enough, you can turn the feelings into a badge that God really loves me and you're back into works righteousness, except it's emotional works righteousness. So the answer is a prayer life. It's, uh, I, frankly, I did not get to this part in the book. I'd like to write another book on this. But it does mean not just Bible study and then pray for mom and dad and this and that, but taking the word of God and meditating and adoring and confessing that down into your heart until it starts to catch fire. And it may take a long time before it does catch fire, but it will, I think, if you ask God and you, you come in faith. So. Uh, Tim, thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to take a moment. Uh, in a second, we'll, we'll express our appreciation to Tim for speaking tonight. Um, but just from what he was just saying, uh, if you are somebody who, who thinks, well, I do want to take this further, uh, and I'm not quite sure how, um, wouldn't pretend that tonight, or even if you were here last night and tonight, uh, that we've covered all the bases, uh, uh, there's lots more uh, for you to explore. So I want to make some suggestions about how you might do that. Uh, it, maybe someone invited you tonight, uh, they'd be a good person to talk to. Um, perhaps they can make some suggestions to you about how to think further. Um, if you would like to know of uh, other options, then I think you got one of these leaflets uh, hopefully a few moments ago. I uh, hope they were passed around. Um, and inside you'll find a number of courses that are being run over the next few weeks um, in and around uh, Cambridge. Uh, Church is putting on five, six evenings where you can think these things through with others. Um, open to any question, lots of room for discussion, a uh, great way to discuss with others, try and move forward in your thinking. Uh, I do commend those to you. Um, we'd also love you to, to pick up, if, if you'd like to, uh, a free book, um, which is a, a copy of the Gospel of Luke, one of the four accounts of the life of Christ that uh, are found in the Bible. Uh, and uh, if you haven't read through uh, the details of Christ's life, pick one up. Um, uh, they're by the exits as you go out. Uh, also by the exits, uh, three of the books that uh, uh, Tim has written. Um, the, the one that, that chimes in with tonight uh, is Counterfeit Gods. When the empty promises of love, money and power let you down, Tim was just referring to that. So uh, that would be a, a, a follow-on from the topic of this evening. Uh, the Prodigal God uh, explores the parable of the Prodigal Son. Uh, and looks at uh, what the heart of the Christian faith is through that prodigal, uh, through that parable. Uh, and then the, the final book is The Reason for God, 
uh, which explores some of the, the commonest objections and difficulties with the Christian faith uh, and some of the clearest reasons uh, for believing it. Uh, all of those are six pounds uh, and there's a bookstore here by that exit and one back out in the foyer uh, on the way out. Thank you very much for coming tonight uh, and let me ask you to show your appreciation to Tim Keller for speaking to us this evening.